Welcome to today's webinar, Children's Health Insurance Program, What's Next, brought to you by NCSL. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Tara Johnson. The floor is yours. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this very important webinar. My name is Tara Johnson, and I'm a program manager at the National Conference of State Legislatures, also known as NCSL. On behalf of NCSL, I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar titled The Children, Children's Health Insurance Program, known as CHIP. What's next? I would like to thank the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs for collaborating with us on this webinar. I would also like to thank the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, for supporting this webinar. For those of you who don't know, the National Conference of State Legislatures is a bipartisan organization that serves the legislators and legislative staff of the states, commonwealths, and territories. NCSL provides research, technical assistance, and opportunities for policymakers to exchange ideas on the most pressing state issues, and it is an effective and respected advocate for the interests of the states in the American federal system. NCSL operates from Denver, Colorado, and Washington, D.C. NCSL does not advocate for specific policies, nor do we take a position on state issues. This webinar is a platform for information exchange. NCSL staff have been approached by many legislators, both Republicans and Democrats, in the last few months asking about CHIP. We have received general questions such as, who does this cover in my state? Or what does an MOE or maintenance of effort mean? And more complicated questions such as, what should we be considering or looking at if CHIP is changed or not reauthorized by the end of September? What information can I share with my constituents? We hope that this webinar will help answer many of those questions. We also know that as of this morning, there was news that the Senate Finance Committee reached a bipartisan agreement that renews funding for the Children's Health Insurance Program. Our federal staff will cover this update shortly. Before I review the agenda, I'll hand it over to Stacy Collins, who's the Associate Director of Systems Transformation with the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs to share a few welcoming remarks. Thank you, Tara. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, AMCHIP is delighted to co-sponsor this webinar with NCSL. And just to give you a little bit of background on who we are, AMCHIP represents Title V maternal and child health programs in all 50 state public health departments. Our members include directors of maternal and child health programs, directors of programs for children with special health care needs, and other public leaders who work with and support state MCH programs. Our mission is to protect and promote the optimal health of women, children, and families by disseminating best practices in MCH, providing educational opportunities and technical assistance to state professionals, and advocating on our members' behalf in Washington. For the legislators on the call, AMCHIP hopes that you view your state MCH programs as valued partners in your collective work to advance the health of women and children and families in your states. It goes without saying that CHIP is a vital resource for the vulnerable populations that AMCHIP members serve. And indeed, CHIP is an essential component of our nation's pediatric health insurance system. AMCHIP and its members encourage the development of bipartisan solution to funding CHIP, which will reassure families and states that CHIP will continue to serve the 9 million children who depend upon the program for their health and well-being. And I'm going to turn it back to Tara. Great. Thank you, Stacy. On the screen, you'll see an agenda for today's webinar. As the moderator for this webinar, I will briefly provide an overview of what to expect in the next hour. Our first presenter will be Eric Skinner, and he will provide an overview of the Children's Health Insurance Program, known as CHIP, to level set for the remainder of the webinar. The second presenter will be NCSL Senior Policy Specialist Haley Nicholson, and she will provide a federal update on CHIP and what she's hearing in D.C. Finally, we will hear from two state health officials who work in Medicaid and CHIP about their state-specific programs and how federal changes could impact the state program. We have on the webinar Gretchen Hammer from Colorado and Aaron Butler from Tennessee. There will be time for Q&A at the conclusion of the presentations, and participants can ask questions throughout any time during the webinar. Please enter your questions in the chat box on the bottom left-hand side of the screen and specify which speaker you're, you're addressing your question to. I'll read the question and ask the speakers to address them, again, when we get to the Q&A portion of the webinar. 
Today's webinar will be recorded and will be available on NCSL, on NCSL's website by next week as a video archive. I would like to highlight NCSL's webpage on CHIP insurance coverage. Uh, we have a handful of publications on this topic, and I encourage you to take a look when you have a moment. I know AMCHIP also has resources on this topic. Um, and there, when there are official updates on the federal policy, we will include that on our webpage as well. And with that overview, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Eric Skinner is Policy Associate at NCSL. Eric specializes in the Children's Health Insurance Program and in oral health. I'll now hand it over to Eric. Thank you, Tara. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Skinner, and as Tara said, I am a Policy Associate in NCSL's health program. I'll be providing a brief overview to the CHIP program today. We will cover what CHIP is, who is covered, how the program provides states with flexibility, and finally what we're hearing from legislators. Um, so established in, or enacted in 1997, CHIP provides comprehensive health insurance for 8.9 million children across the U.S. The program was designed to cover the gap for families who don't qualify for Medicaid but also cannot afford private health insurance. And to give you an idea about the um, eligibility in CHIP, 24 states cover children at or above 250 percent of the federal poverty level. Um, on the lower end of that spectrum, eight states cover CHIP enrollees below 200 percent of the federal poverty level. The Obama administration pushed for reauthorization in 2009 and again in 2015. Both passed Congress with bipartisan support. Uh, the CHIP program is state administered within federal parameters. In the next slide, I will get into uh, the flexibility states have to administer their own programs. Uh, but the general breakdown in, in responsibility with states executing their own plans and the federal government setting the guidelines, that is the source of the often uh, mentioned state flexibility uh, when we're discussing CHIP. Another important characteristic in this relationship is the maintenance of effort requirement. Um, it was enacted under the Affordable Care Act, um, so it was not part of the 2009 or 2015 reauthorization. Um, the maintenance of effort requirement uh, requires states to keep the same eligibility levels for children in Medicaid and CHIP until 2019. Uh, CHIP is also jointly financed by states and the federal government, and that financing is based on a federal matching rate higher than that of Medicaid. Uh, this enhanced federal medical assistance percentage, or EFMAP, is 23%. Um, and as you can see with, uh, with the ranges of uh, state contribution, the federal government um, can, or states can um, end up achieving a 100% match rate from the federal government. Um, as we saw on the last slide, uh, CHIP has some generous financing options, uh, but the real challenge right now is the funding itself, um, with federal funding set to expire at the end of this month, um, September 30th. Uh, 30 states and D.C. are expected to spend their rem remaining CHIP allotments by the end of the first quarter of fiscal year uh, 2018. And of that group, at least three states are estimated to run out of funding by September. And, and as I mentioned on the last slide, one of the reasons for increased interest in CHIP is that CHIP gives states flexibility. Um, but it's not so much uh, what they do as what um, they do not do that frees up states to tailor their programs to their states' needs. CHIP does not impose on states the requirement to cover children up to a specific income level, and this allows states to set income eligibility at levels they deem most appropriate uh, for their coverage market and uh, state environment. Uh, modest premiums can also help states offset costs, but only minimally, and uh, the premiums for CHIP programs are capped at 5% of, of family income. Um, on that, 26 states require a premium and 25 states require some form of cost sharing. Um, some do both, some do one, and some do neither. And uh, just a note on access, CHIP regulations also specify that a state must ensure access to out-of-network providers when the state is not uh, when the when the network is not adic adequate for the enrollee's medical condition. Um, so I've I've included on this slide a table from uh, uh, it's a chip 
eligibility and enrollment table from MACPAC, which is the Medicaid and CHIP Payment Advisory Commission. Uh, they provide recommendations and analyses um, for the CHIP and Medicaid programs. Um, and I included this to give you an idea how child coverage in CHIP programs varies across states and age le levels. Um, as you can see, it's important to be specific when discussing the CHIP program. Um, federal policies change, uh, policy changes for CHIP can affect states in different ways depending on their income and age-based eligibility levels, total enrollment, and the type of CHIP program uh, that the state employs. And uh, if this seems a little overwhelming, uh, it's because it is. Uh, each state must tailor a program that fits their, their own individual needs, but also um, that satisfy the federally established guidelines. So this, can, this results in, in 50 unique programs around the country, and I will outline the types of CHIP programs um, in a couple slides. So who is covered under CHIP? In 2016, there were 8.9 million children covered uh, by the CHIP program. And that is in relation to uh, 37 million children covered by Medicaid. Um, some states also cover pregnant women at various stages of the pregnancy. Um, because it is smaller in scope and because in many ways it was created in relation to Medicaid, CHIP is said to stand on the shoulders of Medicaid, if you ever hear that that term, that is what it refers to. Uh, there are different rules and requirements depending on which option state choose, but it is worth mentioning that CHIP plans consistently outperform private plans and coverage for pediatric dental services and audiology services. As you can see, uh, all states participate in CHIP. Uh, participation is voluntary, but so far all states have taken advantage of the federal match and flexibility that CHIP provides uh, for covering the health needs of their low-income children. Um, so after accepting the federal dollars, states can design uh, CHIP at, in, in three different ways. Uh, the first as an expansion of their Medicaid program, uh, which is different than the ACA's Medicaid expansion. Um, they can design their program as a separate CHIP program or as a combination of both. And currently eight states in D.C. operate CHIP as, uh, as an expansion of Medicaid. Two states operate CHIP as a separate program, and 40 states operate a combination program. And in states using the Medicaid expansion program, federal Medicaid rules uh, do apply. Um, so finally, what we are hearing uh, from state legislators and other, other state stakeholders. Uh, state legislators are searching for certainty around CHIP funding. Um, if they are not able to rely on federal funding, legislators do face difficult budgetary decisions, um, and their choices are whether or not to freeze enrollment, discontinue the program, or appropriate the difference between the state share and the overall cost of the program. And as well, special sessions are often required to deal with such changes, and that costs the state uh, both time and money. And now, the officials responsible for impl implementing CHIP are generally Medicaid directors and CHIP directors. Uh, we're hearing that they, they often feel they're in, a, in freeze mode because they, too, count on predictable federal funding to develop their agency's budget, and as we've learned, um, they can have a federal share of up to 50 percent of that state's entire CHIP program. Um, and finally, the governors have also weighed in on, on this issue. The National Governors Association uh, submitted a letter to Congress urging them to act quickly to expen extend CHIP for five years, um, which uh, also echoes the MACPAC recommendations or the Medicaid and CHIP Payment Advisory Commission. Um, they recommended the same length of time for the extension. Okay, and that is the overview. I will now hand it back to Tara Johnson. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, another issue we've been hearing from legislators, you know, they're hearing quite a bit from their constituents as well, in particularly from parents and families that have a child with special health care needs. Um, that's something that we've heard a handful of times from, from our members as well. Um, now I will introduce our next presenter, who is Haley Nicholson. She's a senior policy specialist at the National Conference of State Legislatures. Haley covers federal health and human services policy at NCSL, and she is based in our Washington, D.C. office. I will now hand it over to Haley for a federal update. 
Thanks, Tara. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the federal update, which changes rapidly these days, um, but exciting news. So the CHIP funding, as many of you know, uh, there's been a lot of discussion. It needs to be authorized before the end of this month um, to maintain the funding that Eric's been talking about and explaining in the states. Um, there was a study that came out in SMACPAC showing that the funding um, would, not, it would not start to run out in most of the states until December 2017. So that was also being considered uh, while people were negotiating um, the, the CHIP package. Um, earlier this year, some of you may be aware, the President's budget and congressional legislation proposed several different changes to the program, including changing CHIP funding to a block grant or per capita cap system, um, the elimination of this increased rate, uh, FMAP rate at 23%, and, transi and transitioning children um, from certain income levels from expanded Medicaid, Medicaid coverage back to the CHIP program. I mentioned this piece because uh, throughout the year, obviously, the Congressional, both in the House and Senate, were working on health care reform legislation, and this had kind of put CHIP um, it kind of delayed the schedule of when the House and the Senate may have had a hearing around this. So last week, the Senate Finance Committee hold the hearing on CHIP. Um, and there is a point in here, I apologize, there was a miscommunication on my part. There was no markup of this in the House Committee this week. That was, i confused that was a different hearing. But the Senate Finance did hold um, a CHIP hearing last week. The Senate hearing had three witnesses come a mother of a CHIP recipient, the executive director of the Medicaid and CHIP Payment and Access Commission, and the Virginia Department of Medical Assistance Services. So today, um, there was consensus on funding CHIP before the end of this month on both sides of the aisle, but there were still a few issues being discussed, whether to, re to maintain this increased rate of 23%, the vehicle through which CHIP would be passed, uh, with the option, or not with the option, excuse me, with the passage last week of hurricane assistance funds, there was a little bit of concern of how CHIP would be passed, uh, what vehicle that would be used through because of this funding that obviously unexpectedly came up. Um, and there's also a piece of Medicare extenders that could be attached to CHIP. Traditionally, CHIP is a program that comes, that when it is voted on, it's clean. It doesn't have any kind of extenders attached to it because it is a bipartisan program and it is well liked uh, amongst many members. Um, so as of this morning, we found out that the Senate Finance Committee has worked on a, a bipartisan deal. And there's a couple pieces um, that the proposed agreement includes. It does include a five-year extension of CHIP, which was, as Eric said, endorsed by the NGA and MACPAC and other organizations. Um, they came to negotiation on the e EFMAP rate. So it will be that 23 percentage point um, for about two more years, and then it will continue. It will start to wind down. That was part of the negotiation. So it will wind down to about 11.5% in 2020, and then it will be eliminated in 2021. Um, so this was done because some of the states that are doing this maintenance of effort, they have this percentage, not to essentially pull the rug out from under them and just eliminate it right now because as we've been describing and many of you know the states have already budgeted for what they thought they would be receiving. So this is part of the negotiation. Um, there are rep different reports on this. The Senate Finance put out a statement, both the chairman and the ranking member, and they highlighted the five-year extension piece. This is about $8 billion. And as far as the other parts of this, we're still waiting for official language from the Senate Finance Committee. Um, so to ensure a renewal of these funds before the end of the month, a deal was reached, but a vote has to be scheduled, and it has to be scheduled obviously within the next few weeks. They have under 14 legislative days to get that scheduled. Um, so as, there, as this obviously this changed this morning, reports were saying they were working on both sides to do a final deal. That has been reached. Now we'll see if this will be put on the floor and we'll, we'll wait for final language. Um, that said, and we've heard this from congressional staff throughout the process, that if your state, if you have input or suggestions on the CHIP program, please continue to reach out to your federal members 
um, especially in the Senate, as they are, they just kind of worked out this deal, and they hopefully will be able to schedule a vote. Um, but that is, again, we encourage you, if you feel like you need to reach out, please do so. Um, I also wanted to mention that NCSL, our co-chairs from our HHS committee, will be sending a letter today to the chairman and ranking member of the Senate Finance Committee, as well as um, the Senate Majority and Senate Minority Leaders, encouraging them to get this vote done before the end of September to give states that insurance that they need for future programming on CHIP, um, and also thanking them for supporting because our, we also want to, our coaches are supported in reauthorization and supporting that effort as well. So congressionally, that is where we are at at this moment. As we hear more updates, or once we are provided with language, we are happy to share that with folks as well. And I'll take it back. I'll go back to Tara. Great. Thank you so much, Haley, for that that update. Um, as a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box, and our speakers will respond to them during the Q and A section of the webinar. Next, we will move on to state activities. Our next two presenters are policy and implementation experts from Colorado and Tennessee. They will each take about five minutes or so to share information on their state-specific CHIP programs, and then we will have a facilitated discussion um, around their programs and um, what federal policy changes may mean. Our first presenter is Gretchen Hammer. She's the Medicaid Director at the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing. Gretchen oversees the office which administers the public health insurance for low-income and disabled Coloradans, including Medicaid and the Child Health, health Plan Plus. Before joining the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing in 2015, Ms. Hammer was the Executive Director of the Colorado Coalition for the Medically Underserved and served as past chair and member of the Board of Directors for Connect for Health Colorado. I will now hand it over to Gretchen. Terrific. Thank you all very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you and share a little bit about uh, the journey that we've been on in Colorado as we have contemplated uh, this deadline that is now uh, just a few days before us. We really began um, this conversation about the future of CHIP uh, early on, back in 2015, in fact, we held a series of stakeholder meetings. And so it's really been an area of focus uh, during my tenure here at the department. So as my bio suggests, we are the department that oversees the Medicaid and CHIP program. It is called the Child Health Plan Plus here in Colorado, and it is a separate program from our Medicaid program, uh, and, but it still aligns with our mission of improving healthcare access and outcomes for the people that we serve while demonstrating sound stewardship of our financial resources. So this uh, mission statement really captures the duality of our responsibility as a public health insurance administrator, and that is to make sure people are able to access needed services, but also to continue to always be diligent about our oversight of these important resources. So from uh, the perspective of what the CHIP program is in Colorado, um, this is the information from our last um, year, the number of the, ch the numbers have actually climbed in our CHIP program. Current enrollment is at about 75,000 children and about 750 pregnant women. Part of that is that the economy in Colorado is quite strong, and as I think was mentioned earlier, we really do contemplate uh, CHIP as a, a, an interim step between uh, full uh, benefits of the Medicaid program to a program uh, like the CHIP program, which is structured to be a little bit more like private health insurance. There is an enrollment fee. The co-pays are structured a little bit differently and really is a, a public-private partnership. It's a fully capitated managed care program here in the state of Colorado. So we have seen growth, uh, but as you can see, it is important to note that it really is focused on children and that the benefit structure um, that we have built around the CHIP program is really focused at improving children's lives and making sure they launch into adulthood um, sufficiently. We also share with you a, a, a graph of the state of Colorado because the other piece that has been difficult about this issue is that there are children enrolled in the CHIP program 
all over the state of Colorado. And clearly in some of our larger metro area, sort of in the middle, there are a lot of children. Um, but you'll see in our you know, smaller rural counties, some of these families can be you know, 34 kids, 35 kids. So it's hard for us, or it has been a challenge for us to think about how would we unravel a program or how would we communicate effectively with families, providers, and others about the future of this program, uh, both so that we're clear that everybody's getting the message, but also so that we're clear that um, we have the right resources to direct people to as we tell them that they may need to go find other coverage or that their coverage has ended through the CHIP program. So uh, the county distribution has been important. Um, we do have a group here at the department called our Member Experience Advisory Council. It's a group of currently enrolled parents mostly, as well as individuals who are enrolled in the Medicaid program. And what they shared with us when we talked to them about how we could communicate effectively about the potential uh, future of the CHIP program, they really did suggest to us that it was such a complicated issue that we would need individualized communication and sort of person-to-person person -person communication that sort of our typical ways of communicating just electronically were probably not going to be sufficient. So again, a big challenge to us as we contemplate the size of the state of Colorado as well as the dispersed uh, population enrolled in the CHIP program. So as I mentioned, we really began some conversations um, a long time ago, back in August of 2015 in part to let our stakeholders know that we were wanting to have a conversation about what's working best in our program, what as we contemplate an uncertain future would we want to preserve before we got into uh, sort of debating the policy and solutions, right? We wanted to start with some guiding principles about what's working well. So some of the guiding principles that came out was, you know, you really do need benefits within your CHIP program that meet the needs of developing children. That um, I think we have a phrase around here, you know, children are not small adults. They don't just do a benefit structure that would perhaps uh, work for an adult population. So we had a nice set of stakeholder engagement. Um, we updated our governor's office and involved them We've been having this conversation with the members of our legislature, really letting them know that we do have an uncertain future ahead and that we need to be prepared for that. As you know, things have been quiet. We've been sort of waiting. Uh, and as uh, you're aware, some of the future of CHIP conversations appropriately were put on pause as larger uh, federal health care reform conversations went on over the summer. So we really did feel the need to begin to, to contingency plan. And so you'll see here what our messaging is around our contingency planning. We really did go back to our statute. We read our statute hundreds of times. We had our Attorney General issue us some formal guidance around some pieces of our statute that we didn't find clear in terms of what direction it gave us. We've been negotiating and sort of trying to stay in touch with CMS officials to understand how would we appropriately unwind this population uh, or this program and what would be our responsibilities to make sure families are appropriately assessed to see whether they're Medicaid eligible or hand it off to our exchange, Connect for Health Colorado, et cetera. So at this point in time, our plans are that there would be no change in funding or, and in um, eligibility, enrollment, or access to benefits because Colorado is one of those states that has some federal allotment left to spend. We anticipate that we would run out of current federal allotment in early first quarter, so January, February of 2018. And so we're trying to uh, walk the fine balance of hoping Congress will take action, but preparing if they do not, and trying to communicate with our members. The one thing I will share, and then I'll, I'll wrap up because I know there's question and answers and you want to hear from Tennessee, but when we asked our member experience advisory council sort of what's your first reaction to hearing that the CHIP program may go away in Colorado, you know, their answers were pretty visceral. They were scared. There was panic. There was fear. There was shock. Um, and again, I think in particular for those who have children with complex health needs, um, fear of having to change the provider that their child is perhaps getting very good care from, not knowing how to navigate finding either different public health insurance options for their child or enrolling them in a private health insurance product. 
So I think this is a very emotional issue when we go back to what, what this program means to a number of uh, middle income families in Colorado who uh, have benefited from having their children and for the pregnant women um, have access to this important set of, set of services and, and, and health insurance coverage. So with that, I'll turn it over, I believe, to Tennessee, and then we'll begin the question and answers. Great, thank you, Gretchen. Um, I will introduce Aaron Butler, our next speaker. Aaron Butler is the Director of Policy for the Division of Ten Care. In this role, Aaron plays, provides policy and planning leadership for Tennessee's Medicaid and CHIP programs, which serve approximately 1.4 million Tennesseans. Aaron has worked with the Division of Ten Care since 2011. I will now hand it over to Aaron. Uh, thank you, Tara. And, um, Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to, to speak with you today. Just to give you a, a quick overview of what the CHIP program looks like in Tennessee, just as a, a, a representative state among um, 50 states and additional territories, um, we cover uh, uninsured children and, and pregnant women with family incomes at or below 250% of the federal poverty level in Tennessee. Um, Eric mentioned that we sometimes talk about CHIP as being a, a program that stands on the shoulders of Medicaid, which you see uh, on this slide. Um, uh, we provide comprehensive package of medical behavioral benefits for our members. To talk some about the flexibility that um, has been described re relative to CHIP programs, um, around the nation. We operate, like most states, what we would describe as a combination program, which includes a, a separate CHIP that stands uh, apart from our Medicaid program, which is the larger component in Tennessee that covers about uh, 68,000 children and 5,000 pregnant women. And then we also have a component of our program uh, that is uh, a Medicaid expansion, so these are children that are eligible for CHIP that are served within our, our Medicaid program, about 19,000 uh, of these children. And to talk about the topic that's on everyone's mind as, as the end of the month approaches, uh, to talk sort of about where we are in relationship to uh, the potential um, ending of, of federal funding, uh, in our experience, is going to be very similar to what Gretchen described for, for Colorado. But as we know, um, federal funding is scheduled to end on September 30th. Um, in Tennessee, we're monitoring our enrollment and our expenditures closely, uh, and we believe that at this time uh, we have enough funds in our existing allotment that would allow us to continue uh, our current program sometime into April or May uh, of 2018. So um, we're trying to be intentional about sort of planning for what needs to happen if that funding is not extended. At the same time, um, at the same time, recognizing that we have a little bit of time. So we're communicating actively with our, our governor's office uh, and with our congressional delegation so that they uh, hopefully understand sort of the urgency of the situation uh, from our perspective. Um, as Gretchen said for Colorado, it's, it's the same for Tennessee. Because we have this unused uh, funding still in our allotment, we, we don't anticipate any immediate changes to eligibility or enrollment or benefits on October 1st. We've got uh, a few months that, that we believe we can continue the program as is. Um, but as you know, to, to wind down a program uh, like the Children's Health Insurance Program uh, is a process that takes uh, a number of, of months, a lot of time, a lot of engagement both with CMS, with the provider community here in Tennessee, with um, our General Assembly, of course, and with, most importantly, our, our members and their families. Um, so as we think about what that might look like if funding is exhausted, um, we're thinking about uh, both the, the members in our separate CHIP who would need to be referred to other insurance affordability programs, um, as well as our Medicaid expansion children who, um, because of maintenance of effort requirements, it's our understanding uh, we would be required to continue covering only at a reduced uh, matching rate from the federal government, which creates uh, budgetary issues for us in the state. Um, 
so at this point, we're trying to walk that fine line that Gretchen described where we're, we're trying not to, to hit the panic button. We're trying uh, to be very intentional in our messaging to our members and to our stakeholders here in the Tennessee. Um, we, there's, we do not want to um, alarm anyone unnecessarily if we have an expectation that the funding is going to be continued. And the news uh, coming out of the Finance Committee last night was certainly a welcome news for us, but at the same time, being prudent in our conversations with CMS, with our governor's office about what, what the, the unwinding process would look like, what that timeline uh, would entail, uh, and what would become of those members who, who do need to be disenrolled if the federal funding is exhausted and then new funding is not made available from, uh, by Congress. So I think I'm going to stop there because I know we have some discussion questions. Um, so Tara, do I give this to you now? Sure. Thank you, Erin. I appreciate that overview of the Tennessee TRIP program. Thank you. I now have a few questions for our presenters before we move into audience Q&A. Uh, for both of the speakers, and Gretchen, perhaps you can answer first, and we'll just go in that order. How has flexibility in this program helped you design a program that fits the needs of your state? How are and are there innovative parts of your state chip program that you would like to share with the audience? Sure. Thank you very much. I, you know, I, I think that the history of the chip program is is important and interesting, and and that perhaps some of the federal flexibility allowed us to take the path that we took. But you know, in the mid 1990s, Colorado contemplated. The, the sort of reality that there was a gap between uh, the Medicaid program and what families could potentially afford in the private market, and that the CHIP program was an important uh, space to, to fill. And, and it was really important, and it's actually written into our statute, that this not be considered an entitlement program, um, that it really was uh, not, not wanting to be framed as if it was Medicaid-like in that way. And so that's why we have some differences in it in terms of an enrollment fee um, that's graduated based on income and family size, a few more limits on the benefit plan. Um, so really, it has been an important program to help people as they move on a, on a trajectory toward the ability to, uh, to afford private health insurance um, to have perhaps the Medicaid benefit and then uh, to move into the, the CHIP benefit, et cetera. So I do think that there have been some ways in which we've used the flexibilities of the federal structure to really meet the identified need. We did expand, similar to Tennessee, our income level is 250% of the poverty level, and that was an expansion that was more recent uh, in the last eight years or so, uh, again, out of a recognition of the growing cost of private health insurance and of the criticalness of having children have access to the appropriate support. So yes, we've taken advantage of the flexibility. The one thing I will say is that it is, um, we do think about though and wonder as we make changes to our broader Medicaid program, we are a Medicaid expansion state. Um, you know, have we made the same sort of innovative investments in our CHIP program, just given the size differential? We've got about 1.3 million Coloradans in the Medicaid program, again, compared to about 75,000 children and 750 pregnant women in CHIP. So I do think we face that tension of making sure we give the CHIP program the appropriate attention in terms of program design, et cetera. But we certainly have appreciated and taken advantage of the federal flexibilities. And in Tennessee, I would echo much of what, what Gretchen just said. Um, we've certainly benefited from the flexibility that historically has been available in CHIP, um, which has allowed us to design a program that we think makes the most sense for Tennessee. Um, uh, the, the flexibility that Gretchen mentioned with regard to, to cost sharing, uh, reasonable copays, uh, certain benefit limits uh, are, are certainly make our CHIP program a little bit more like a commercial insurance product than a, a traditional uh, Medicaid product. Um, so that's uh, flexibility that we've taken advantage of. Uh, uh, I certainly echo what Gretchen said as well about the role that CHIP plays sort of in that space between the Medicaid, which is, is the, the lowest income individuals, and then the commercial insurance market. Um, I mentioned that Tennessee has a um, 
a combination program where some of our children are enrolled in our Medicaid program and some of our, our children are enrolled in a separate uh, CHIP. Uh, as far as I know, we're unique in that um, in Tennessee, our Medicaid expansion uh, product is limited uh, to children who were previously enrolled in Medicaid. Uh, they lose Medicaid eligibility uh, for some reason, usually due to a change in income. Uh, and, and we're through the, the Medicaid expansion option that's available under CHIP, we're able to keep them uh, enrolled in the Medicaid product, which um, we think helps uh, promote continuity of care. It helps keep families with multiple siblings, multiple children together on the same plan, which we think has, has benefits for families. Uh, I know other states configure their Medicaid expansion populations and their separate CHIP populations differently. That's just sort of how we do it in Tennessee, but I think it's a, a great example of sort of uh, how states can take advantage of, of the flexibility that, that the federal government provides through Title 21 to, to structure CHIP programs that, that really meet the needs of their citizens. Great. Thank you both for those thorough answers. Um, the next question I have is for Gretchen. And we know that Colorado posted information on your Medicaid and CHIP webpage about Colorado's anticipated response if CHIP is not reauthorized this month. And so my question is, what prompted Colorado to actually post this information publicly? And can you take just a minute or two to tell us about how Colorado would need to address the changes to the CHIP program if it's not reauthorized? Uh, sure. I, I will mention you know, one of the things we're most proud of uh, in our administration of the Medicaid and CHIP program here in Colorado is our engagement with our stakeholders. And by stakeholders, we mean um, members we, through our Member Experience Advisory Council and through just our general day-to-day -day operations. We work hard to try and stay connected to those that we serve and also to our advocacy community and our provider community. So it really was, again, like I said, back in August of 2015 when we began this conversation and really wanted to center it on what are our shared goals if we have to contemplate uh, the end of the CHIP program? What would we want to make sure we preserve and protect and even do better than what we do today in our CHIP program? So we started that conversation very early in part because, again, it can be during a legislative session, as I'm sure those on the phone could attest to, having to come up with complex policy ideas can be difficult. The time is just is limited and, and everyone's got a lot on their plate. And so we started in the summer to try and open up that conversation to show that the state agency was, was paying attention to the federal landscape and wanted to be a good partner in this conversation. We ha did the same. We've been updating our members of our Joint Budget Committee and General Assembly. So it really was important that um, we continue that level of transparency and communication. We also had a couple of um, technical things that we needed to do. So we are building what is called, we're jokingly calling the magic switch. Uh, I think as Aaron alluded to, unrolling a program and all of the technology systems that states put in place to administer these programs is not easy. And we were trying to be responsible in our planning by trying to build an eligibility switch which isn't really a switch, but we're just calling it that, um, that we would be able to turn on or off in terms of allowing people to enroll if Congress didn't act and, you know, the day the sort of federal money runs out. And so in doing so, we had to publicly announce that project because of some other infrastructure in our state. And so in order to make sure everyone knew what we were really up to, we felt like we had to comprehensively explain what the plan was so that when we began moving the technology fix through the public process that it goes through, engaging with members of the Joint Budget Committee. I go in front of the Joint Budget Committee next week in a quarterly update to them in which this will be an agenda topic, that stakeholders weren't surprised at what the department was doing. So that's really what led to that sort of more comprehensive set of talking points, if you will, that are on our website, is we wanted to be sure that there was one source, because this issue is so complex and the options are so vast, that we had one source of information on the department's website and that people could begin to build the, the habit of checking there um, to see if there were updates to what the department was planning and having to adjust to at the federal level. 
Great. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, I'll ask probably one more question before we move to audience questions. I see a couple coming through the chat box here. Um, Aaron, how is Tennessee's CHIP program preparing to maintain or change its CHIP program in the next fiscal year? Uh, sure. And um, uh, a lot of the, the conversation or a significant part of the answer to that question, of course, it sort of depends on what action Congress does or doesn't take in the next uh, couple of weeks or, or months. Um, if, uh, if funding is not continued, uh, Gretchen's just done a great job of sort of um, describing some of the processes that, that we need to go through, you know, both technology um, to our, our chip enrollment systems, uh, member communications, provider communications, um, referring uh, families and members to, to other sources of coverage if available. Um, we have not done what Colorado has done. We have not done as much as Colorado has done, I don't think, in terms of public messaging at this point. A lot of our conversations have still been um, sort of within uh, state government and, and between ourselves and CMS about what that planning looks like. Um, again, sort of trying to walk that fine line between hoping we don't have to, to go down that road, but being prepared to walk that road if we need to. Um, if we don't have some resolution, in, in the next few weeks we'll probably have to begin some of that more public uh, conversation about what this will look like if we need to, to unwind the program. If the federal funding is continued, um, then I, I think um, then we continue the, the program as it is. We don't have any immediate changes to, to change our, our eligibility structure or criteria. We think those are probably about right. One change we're working on in our, our CHIP program at this time in Tennessee is uh, considering moving out uh, more of the fee-for-service world and into uh, managed care um, like Colorado's program. Um, Tennessee's Medicaid program is heavily heavily managed care and has been for a long time. And that's been a successful model for us within the Medicaid space to really help control cost and drive program improvement at the same time. And so we're having conversations about um, how that approach could also be applied to our CHIP program uh, so that we've got um, those same levers that we, that we can use to hopefully continue to drive improvement in that space as well. Um, so that's sort of um, our next big sort of transition that we see on the horizon for, for Tennessee's CHIP program. Fantastic. Thank you, Erin. So we'll move ahead and go to audience Q&A. Um, I see a couple coming through, and I also received a few individually through the chat box. So we'll go through those. If other folks have any questions, please enter them in the chat box on the, left, the bottom left-hand side of the screen. Uh, the first question I received um, is for Eric Skinner. And the question is, does the maintenance of effort requirement apply to all states? Okay, thank you, Tara, and, and uh, thanks for that question. So the, the short answer is that the maintenance of efforts apply the, maiden, the maintenance of efforts requirement applies to all the states. And uh, so tracing it back to the Affordable Care Act, the ACA put forth um, both CHIP and Medicaid maintenance of efforts maintenance of effort requirements, and I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes in because based on the composition of the individual state program, those Medicaid or CHIP maintenance of efforts requirements on the federal level may or may not apply. So to condense it down, um, these maintenance of efforts requirements for Medicaid and, and CHIP um, will impact a CHIP Medicaid expansion program differently than it will impact a separate CHIP program. So I think that's the, uh, that's the, that's the bottom line there. And there are penalties for it. It says that the ACA requires states to maintain income eligi eligibility levels um, as a condition for receiving payments under Medicaid. Um, so the state penalty to, or the penalty to states for not complying with um, either the Medicaid or CHIP maintenance of efforts requirements would be a loss of federal Medicaid matching funds, which each state does receive. Great. Thank you for that response, Eric. And, and for the individual who asked that question, we can certainly follow up with some more information. Um, where? Yes, and I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you, Tara. And I, that I'm referencing a great resource by the Congressional Research 
uh, service, and uh, I will definitely try to get that up with the resources or absolutely very soon on NCSL's chip page, web page. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you for the individual who asked that question. Um, I will move down the line. Uh, the first question we have in the chat box is for Aaron. Aaron, you mentioned a chip is not reauthorized. You would move those numbers to other affordability, um, I think that is supposed to be other affordable insurance programs. Uh, which programs are you referring to? Uh, sure. So if, if the CHIP funding is not reauthorized and, and we are put in a position where we need to disenroll uh, members from, from where they are now in CHIP, um, the first step, and, and hopefully we can, this will all happen systemically uh, and within our IT framework. Um, that's something we're evaluating right now. But the first thing we would do would be to evaluate to see if they're potentially eligible for Medicaid, if there's been some uh, income uh, change that, that would warrant a, a, an eligibility determination for Medicaid. Otherwise, um, what we, we would be doing would be um, referring these families to the, the health insurance marketplace, um, healthcare.gov, uh, Based on income, uh, theoretically all of the families in, in this population should be eligible to receive a, a premium tax credits um, on the exchange. Uh, we understand that if, CHIP, if Tennessee were to end its CHIP program, that would qualify the family for a special enrollment period, so they would have an opportunity uh, to enroll uh, their child in, in a qualified health plan marketed on the exchange. What we're trying to, to evaluate ourselves and also communicate uh, with our, our congressional delegation is, you know, as we've discussed throughout this presentation, CHIP really fills in many ways that gap uh, between traditional Medicaid and the, the commercial insurance market. Um, so theoretically, all of these children, uh, their families would qualify for tax credits uh, to help purchase a, a plan on the exchange. What's not entirely clear is that based on these families' incomes, and these are still low-income families, um, depending on the plans that are available and the plans that they choose, if the plan has uh, significant deductibles or co-insurance costs, uh, it, it's not clear that all of these families would have the, the resources to um, to cover the out-of-pocket costs associated with that private coverage. Um, so that's why it would be preferable, of course, for us to continue our CHIP program as it is, but if that were no longer an option, uh, we would uh, refer them to the exchange. Hey, thank you. We have about three minutes left, so I will read off this last que question. And if, uh, Gretchen, you have a, a quick answer, great. If it's a complicated one, maybe we can follow up via email. Uh, but this last question is for you. How do you think Colorado's fully capitated managed Medicaid program affects the implementation and outcomes of your state's model versus other states that do not have a fully capitated managed care? Um, sure, thank you. So I, I just want to clarify our CHIP program is fully capitated uh, and in, with managed care companies. Our Medicaid program is not. We have an accountable care model that is under a managed care framework but does not include full capitation. So um, it's actually not exactly how it is. I, I, I will, so I can clarify that further if, if the individual wants to follow up. I will just say something though very quickly in our final moments that I think Aaron touched on that's important for all of us who are interested in this program to contemplate, and that is the relationship between CHIP and the exchanges. I think we have for a long time understood the relationship between Medicaid and CHIP and how it can fill and be that stepping stone to a more private market-like product. But I think that this uh, exercise, if you will, has really revealed some of the places where the policy is not abundantly clear um, and that there may be concerns, right? We have concerns, I think, as Erin would describe, not only about affordability of the products available on the exchange, but in rural communities where there are fewer choices or are the 
benefit packages really set up for families perhaps who have a child with complex health needs. So I think that this, um, it's also unclear and we're st still waiting for guidance from CMS whether or not that open enrollment period is just for the child or for the whole family. So there are some places where I think this has revealed um, a new policy and programmatic relationship that maybe we all want to continue to understand and that's the relationship between our CHIP program and our exchange-based program especially given that we administer these programs at the state level. In Colorado, we administer the exchange at the state level, but many states administer their exchange through the federal marketplace. So it's really become a new area of complexity and relation that I think we all want to continue to explore. Great. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you for answering that question and also for those final remarks. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for taking the time to share their expertise with us today. I would also like to thank the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs, as well as the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, for supporting this webinar. Thank you for joining us today. If you have any follow-up questions for NCSL, please email them to Eric or Haley. Their um, email addresses are on the screen now. And if you have any questions for AMSHA, please direct them to Stacy. Her contact information is also on the screen. This webinar has been recorded and will be made available on the NCSL website next week. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful day.